Hey, welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are glad you are here. And just by showing up, you are already demonstrating your very own smarts. Today, I'm pleased to present two people who are experts in more than one area of this music industry. For instance, radio programming, A&R, digital music, among other things. And I promise you will leave smarter and more enlightened than you arrived. <laughs> Before we get started, please let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we want to showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I run the music practice at Turnkey ZRG and I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. This series is my example of trying to help you make more connections. And I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, share your LinkedIn profile, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the session. Also, please make sure your chat is set to address everyone, not just the host and speakers. I wanna thank our program sponsors for without their support, we could not keep this free. Special thanks to First Horizon Bank, Turnkey ZRG, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Tennessee Brew Works, Better Than Booze, and MedJet. And a quick note about MedJet, travel insurance only gets you to the nearest acceptable hospital. A MedJet membership gets you all the way home. If you travel, you need to check out MedJet. Now let's get down to business. Today, I am excited to present Michael Steele. He is what I like to call a music lifer, meaning he has been working in various parts of this business since he was 14 years old. He currently is VP of Streaming and Playlist Strategy at Red Street Records. Red Street was founded by Jay DeMarcus of Rascal Flats to give home to new artists and truly develop music careers. Previously, Michael was Director of Playlist Programming at Warner Music Group, overseeing the curation of 85 playlists for both frontline and catalog repertoire across all streaming platforms. The first 20 years of his career were spent in broadcast radio, both as on-air talent and programming in markets such as Omaha, Charlotte, San Diego, and Los Angeles. First taking the legendary KISS FM back to the top of the ratings and then created, creating alternative station Indy 103.1. In 2004, Indy 103.1 was named by Rolling Stone magazine as the coolest radio station in America. He solidified the station's cred by wooing some of the world's most accomplished and well-respected musicians to join the Indy 103.1 on-air family. Such stars as Dave Navarro from Jane's Addiction to Matt St Sorum from The Cult, Billy Morrison from The Cult, Henry Rollins from Black Flag, The Crystal Method, Rob Zombie, Dickie Barrett from The Mighty Mighty Boss Tones all signed on to host weekly radio shows. Michael, it is such an honor to have you here, and I've been chasing you for a long time to do this, so welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Really appreciate the kind words. That's very nice. I forgot I did half that stuff. But yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, well, there's more. Stay yeah, tuned. i got to remember it. And joining Michael is another highly accomplished lifer, Steve-O Robertson. Steve-O is a longtime A&R executive who spent over 25 years at Atlantic Records, where he rose to the position of GM and SVP of A&R for pop and rock, at Atlantic Nashville. During his illustrious career, Steve-O has been instrumental in signing and launching the careers of major rock acts like Paramore, Shinedown, Rainbow Kitten Surprise, and A Day to Remember, among others. His sharp instincts have not only led to platinum records and Grammy awards for these artists, but also solidified his reputation as a key player in the industry. In addition to his signing achievements, Steve-O has worked closely with other iconic bands such as Collective Soul, Seven Mary Three, and Matchbox 20 during their formative years. <clears throat> he played a crucial role in helping these bands gain significant airplay and traction, which led to multi-platinum success. In 2023, Steve-O founded Severance Records, a joint venture with Big Loud Rock Records, making the, <clears throat> a new chapter in his career. Severance Record is set Records is focused on alternative and indie rock. 
sorry. <laughs> with Dexter and the Moon Rocks as its flagship, flagship artist. It is my pleasure to welcome these rock stars to our platform today. Take it away, boys. Yes. Thanks, Tom. Yes. Thanks, Tom. Steve O. So, you know, what the crazy thing about living in Nashville, um, we both moved here around the same time in 2015, 2016. And um, we, Steve and I actually live about five minutes from each other. And our offices are about a block and a half from each other. And I never see him. Are they? <laughs> Are we a block and a half from each other right now? Yeah, so I am. I'm in the Starstruck Studios. Oh uh, shit! I knew Narvel Blackstock's building on right. 17th, and you are in Big Loud on Edge Hill and 16th. There you go. So, um, yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm stoked to to see you on the screen, and hopefully, we can get uh, coffee and lunch again soon. Yeah, dude. I'm always there. I'm always ready. So what? What's going on, man? Catch me up. What's uh, how's your how's your famous daughter, man? Well, my, you, would, you want to start with Chloe? Yeah. So uh, I moved to Nashville in 2015 and I have this I have two kids. I'm very proud of Cole and Chloe and Chloe is um, she's always been an actor and um, she graduated high school in uh, the worst year possible, 2020. And um, and immediately. Uh, got out of Nashville, went to LA and we got her up and running there. And she booked a movie right away that has Gene Smart in it. And it's called Wildflowers. It's on, or Wildflower, it's on Hulu now. And Chloe was also a lead role in a show called Wolfpack on Paramount Plus and yeah. could not be prouder. And now she's here. She's back here in Nashville, just temporarily making music. She's a great singer, great songwriter. She's in the studio right now. I love it. Like, what's her style? Like, what kind of music? Speaking of style, and she just styled one of our artists yesterday. So we hired her. She also has great style. So she went and started, we're doing a photo shoot on this band, Edge Hill, uh, that we signed. And so Chloe got hired to go uh, help them go shopping with them, basically, and get them styled properly. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. I love that. Um, yeah, man. Well, listen, I, I've been, um, so deep in the weeds here at Red Street for the last four months. I, I, I joined, I, after I left Warner, um, I spent about two years consulting different labels around Nashville in the streaming space and, um, was doing a project actually for Red Street, uh, as a consultant when they had an opportunity, um, to come on full time. And so I ended up, um, shutting down the consultancy and coming here with Jay and Alex Valentine, um, full time. And it's just been incredible. It's, it, you know, um, I, I had, I obviously was a fan of Rascal Flats uh, before uh, coming here, but I didn't know Jay at all. Um, and it's so phenomenal to see an artist who has the business acumen to also run a record company, you know, and what an incredible, not only a musician he is, but an incredible producer and, you know, really wanted to build something that's artist driven, that's completely, um, you know, uh, artist focused and actual uh, artist development. So um, it's been, it's been exciting to, to be in the building. And right now we've got four artists on the country genre space and four in the Christian and contemporary. Is it all records or is it publishing too? Is it, is it yeah, there's publishing too. In fact, that's how he started it in during COVID when, you know, he was, the, the flats were still a very viable touring entity. And when all the shows got shut down, he's like sitting at home doing nothing. And so he started a Christian publishing company because that's, he actually, um, was a, a Christian artist before he started Rascal Flats. And so um, he he started the Christian publishing side, and then they decided to start signing some artists, and then opened up the countryside uh, at the top of um, I guess the top of twenty two is when they started the countryside. So yeah, sweet. And then you came in at when? What was your? I've only been here like three and a half, four months. It was it was basically the top of April. Um, I I was doing a consulting project for them back in like February and March, and um, and they you know we were everything was going great. And they were like, Hey, you know, do you, would you want to make this more permanent? And I was like, well, what are you thinking? And so, um, yeah, so we're, we're still pretty small. I think there's 15 of us total, um, on the, uh, you know, across both the country and Christian side. And, um, we've got in-house PR, in-house creative. Um, we use guerrilla marketing on the, on the agency side. Um, also a company called the assembly for our Christian side. So, um, yeah, it's, um, 
It's been really fun. And it's awesome, the, dude. The Christian it. space is uh, something I've never worked in before. You know, I've always been aware of the big stars in the, in the format, but um, I've never, never worked in the space. So it's been, uh, you know, I, I love to learn. So getting, getting this education and, uh, you know, literally a baptism by fire in the Christian space. <laughs> <laughs> has been has careful, been pretty, careful. yes exactly uh <laughs> has been super uh interesting and being able to learn something new about a side of the business i didn't know anything about nice so, killer yeah amazing um so yeah we're both at fledgling record labels i yeah. can't believe it so after, after years in radio <laughs> yeah man <laughs> right we have all this stuff in common it's amazing we really yeah. do and yeah, it, me starting in radio in Florida and coming up in in the 90s and ending up a program director at an alternative rock station in Orlando. And, and it, right, I think you were doing the yeah. same thing in LA, right? Yeah. Were you, yeah, at, yeah. When were you well, at Indy? And that's the thing, like we didn't know each other back then, but I was certainly aware of your radio station because you were one of the few guys out there that was playing unsigned artists and like looking right. for new bands. And we were doing the same thing in LA and there wasn't very many stations like that. You know, everything, even back then, it, the corporate radio was very prevalent and you couldn't do anything like that. Um, and so I always followed your radio station and you and, and you know, to see what new stuff. In fact, I, I, I love the story of how you made the transition from being a radio programming guy and being on air into A&R. Like, how did that unfold? Um, so WJRR Orlando, I worked there from, I mean, anybody listening, uh, you know, the sweet spot of grunge and alternative rock, the explosion happened, you know, Nirvana released Nevermind in 1991. And that was like this explosion that lasted, you know, pretty much the entire decade. So I started it in 92, 93 programming an alternative rock station, the first commercial one in Florida. And, um, I already knew all this. I was already a fan of Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins and and Pearl Jam and all these bands that Orlando had not even heard yet. I was I just was one of those music freaks that was way into it. Started adding records and and seeing what works and actually using call out research, which people don't like, but you could sort of see what was a hit and what wasn't. And I didn't, we weren't owned by a giant corporation. And so they let me, some idiot, 20, <laughs> 22, how old was I? That's probably oh, was my late, mid to late 20s, add records. I didn't have to really ask anybody. There wasn't like, <laughs> now it's a court, now a corporation makes a decision. Nothing against our, our wonderful radio partners out there. <laughs> but now a lot of it is a corporation, a corporate decision. So, and I was very happy to have that leeway. And then, yeah, so the, we started to get, music sent to the station by local and regional acts and i got a seat with it wasn't links it wasn't soundcloud it wasn't mp3s it was they sent us cds and like a caveman we used to open you remember <laughs> it seems so like ridiculous <laughs> now now we're click links and back then we'd take the cd out and then this band collective soul had like the t most mid ridiculous artwork on their album i was like i have to see what this sounds like and i went through it and i heard this song called shine I don't want to go into the long story of it, but it was, they were out of Atlanta. They were unsigned. They happened to hire a promotion company trying to make something happen with this record. Shine. I was like, sounds like a hit to me. I don't know. I don't care if it's not signed. And I added it to the radio station. And again, this is the nineties, no internet, no Spotify, no Apple. It was just the radio. That's how people heard it. That and MTV. Right. So, yeah. and well, then, Al Moss is in the in the chat right now saying that you are single handedly responsible for breaking that thing at radio. Oh, is he? I'm not even looking at the chat. Hey, Al. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up. It's hey, thank you for everybody who's uh, talking. That's to very nice that people yeah. showed up. Uh, I thought it was just you and I talking here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so Collective Soul. And so it ended up being like we added it into rotation. And the, my boss, John Frost, that I worked for, he was like, I don't care if it's signed or not. Do you think it's a hit? And I'm like, yeah, it's a hit. And it was. <laughs> and then so it, uh, Atlanta came down to Orlando. You know, this record started selling out of Orlando and Atlantic Records came down and Jason Flom signed the band. And the very next year, that song was a number one song and they played Woodstock and it was like they became this wow. big band. And that was my first, you know, people from labels were like, you, you should do, you found that you should do A&R. And I'm like, I, I'm just trying to play hits on my radio station. I don't give a shit 
if they're signed, yeah. not signed. I just want like songs and ratings and to try to break bands. So anyway, that's that's where the light bulb went off. Like, oh, you should. I don't know. What, I didn't know what A and R was, and I figured out what A and R was. I was like, that is for me. <laughs> right on. I like radio, but A and R sounds like even more fun. Right. So, um, and I figured getting a track record would be a good thing to do. And so I was like, all right, well, I have a hundred thousand watt radio station at my disposal. <laughs> like, nobody cares. Nobody's. What could go wrong? What could what go wrong? Could, right. I could broadcast go anything I want. <laughs> but anyway, I, I the idea was to find another band, another artist that we could break there. And I figured if I did it two times in a row, then I could get a job doing A&R. So I did. There was a band called Seven Mary Three. They were out of Orlando. Um, they had a song called Cumbersome. I heard it. I don't know what it is that makes me go, oh, that sounds like a hit. But And it, it didn't sound very good at the time. It was like, like a real demo quality song. Same exact thing happened literally the same thing happened just yep. kind of played it a few times people called the radio station as you remember yeah i was, was in no... at the time i was in right. there was no shazam no there there's like the phones literally lit up when you played something that people like they want to know what it was so they could go buy it at the record store seems like a million years ago right but <laughs> it's you know so anyway uh so said mary three happened and then um i started playing a song called 3 a.m by a band called Tab of the Secret. They were also from Orlando. They ended up um, signing with Atlantic Records uh, and they became Matchbox 20. So I don't take full credit for anything. I don't, I just, I just was, there was a string of music coming through the Southeast and through Florida. I had a radio station, played the music and it turns out the music business is looking for people that can spot hits, right? So so they hired me in 1997. Wow. And uh, yeah, man, that's how I became an A&R guy. And they, they let me live, let me stay in Orlando. So I just, you know, I'm like, I'm a surfer. I'll just go to the, I'll listen to demos on the way to the beach. And <laughs> I mean, I don't want to go too far into, it was, it was an incredible, you know, yeah. lifestyle. So that's how the transition happened. Um, what, tell me about the thread that got you, you did so many formats. How many different formats did you do? Well, actually not that many. Um, I only did top 40 or pop uh, and alternative rock. Um, I, you know, early in my career, I think I, I was on an NPR station and I had to play classical CDs or something, but I, that wasn't like, that, I was just like a board opera, you know? Um, and, and I, I started off in rock and then realized that the money were better and the, the girls were hotter in uh, the, the top 40 world. And <laughs> so, so I decided to be a flamethrowing top 40 jock. Um, and uh, so that that's how I made that transition. Is that when you became Michael Steele? Michael Steele? Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, I'm going to I somebody will out me if I don't just you just own up to it that that was in omaha nebraska and my name was adam thunder oh, holy <laughs> shit wait yeah. that was your first radio name was adam yeah. thunder adam thunder yeah you, Dude, like you were going for it yeah i um somebody found a promo picture of me and put it on facebook a couple of years ago that you know it's the black and white eight by ten that said uh adam thunder <laughs> so um yeah, there you go. So that's some alpha male shit right there. So, but then you settled <laughs> in. You're like, what can I do to be like? So then you, Michael Steele. That, that's a you know, yeah, that's yeah. maybe a step, I mean, a notch down, right? You try right, to right, down exactly, exactly. So, um, um, and yeah, but I, you know, so I that that journey too was was um, interesting, you know, and then going from from Omaha to San Diego to Los Angeles, and then doing top 40 at the biggest pop station in the world. And everybody thought I was crazy because at that, at that period of time, the sound was uh, on radio was very much Lilith fair. So the big artists out were Sarah McLaughlin and Jewel and Natalie Merchant, you know, 10,000 maniacs. And everybody's like, why are you going to go to this top 40 station? That's that music's dead. That's not happening anymore. And I was like, but it's kiss FM. It's like Rick D's in the morning. It's like, it, it's the biggest well-known pop station in the world so went there and within three months um i remember a promo guy brought me a song that this i was going to ask you this question because i want to know what your biggest miss was and this i'll tell you is my biggest miss 
so this radio guy, uh, radio promo guy from Jive Records brings me this CD and we listen to it in my office and the artist is sitting there in my office and I'm listening and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And he goes, he, he says, he, he has the artist go out to the lobby and he's like, you're going to be there for us, man. Like, we're, we got to break this girl. She was on the Disney show or whatever. She was a Disney kid. You got to, you know, and I was like, dude, that is a piece of shit. What is that song? That is complete crap. And, and he, I said, we are never going to play that song on Kiss. And I said, you just move on, find another artist, find a different song. Cause that thing is junk. And it was um, baby one more time by Britney Spears. Wow. So <laughs> check out the ears, check out the ears on Michael Steele Jesus. Or, or the lack thereof. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that was my, probably my biggest miss. Uh, fortunately I've been more right than I was wrong over the years and in, in picking the hits. But... I, it's brave to do that. And I, and I know you mentioned wanting to know like, a and R wise in my mm -hmm. A and R career and choosing what to sign and what not to sign, I will never divulge. There's a small handful. Come on, of, come of on. That, no, 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 no. But I will say, at, in, in in the radio time, it's a little easier, like with records and radio. Like, uh, you know, ninety nine percent of what was coming out was my favorite. Is my favorite music of all time, whether it was Smashing Pumpkins or Pearl Jam or Stone Temple Pilot, like all of that stuff. And even like the second tier bands like Better Than Ezra and Our Lady Peace, like there was so much hit alt rock music coming out. But I will say the one I was slowest to was uh, Weezer. Yeah. Weezer, like, I, you know what I mean? Like their whole thing was they're not cool. Like yeah. they're nerds. Yeah. And that combined and Undone the Sweater song, right, was the first yeah. single. Yeah. And they had to really work me hard on that one. I was like, this is fucking now I love Weezer, but mm -hmm. like, so yeah, yeah, listen, dude, we're all wrong, you know, a bunch of times. Well, do you see Patch Culberson in the in the chat? He goes, We don't talk about the misses. Yes, Patch. <laughs> because I'm telling you, people's memory works that way. They're not like, oh, that's the shine down guy. That's the yeah. paramour. They're the that's the guy that passed on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. Hey. Yeah. Um, so I that yeah, you know, when I was doing top 40, you know, that we had an incredible run because if you remember at that point, so Britney basically started, and then the next thing they brought me was Backstreet Boys, and then it was in sync, and then it was like, you know, it was this juggernaut of top 40 and pop that just lasted like four years. You know, um, it was like we couldn't lose every single song that came out was a massive, massive hit. Ricky Martin. Um, I'm trying to think of like Shakira. And, you know, it was just this great time in top 40 when I happened to be at Kiss. So uh, yeah. always good for that. And that and to tie it back to Orlando, all the mm -hmm. that was the boy band factory was Orlando, which is where I I didn't really have anything to do with that world. But yeah. People are like, wow, why would Atlantic Records have an A and R guy in Orlando, Florida? Like that makes no sense. You're either in New York or L.A. or Nashville or maybe Atlanta. Yeah. And because in the '90s there was the boy band fact, there was Lou Pearlman and the whole Transcon thing and and Sync and all that. That was like it kind of formed like a center of gravity for like industry. And then the EDM world was huge out of Orlando during that time. And then the rock thing was happening, whether it was Creed or Matchbox 20 or Seven Mary Three or you like. And then Seven Dust was part of it. And, you know, Limp Bizkit came out of a little bit later out of. Yeah. So there was there was that reason to be there uh, during that time. And so, uh and I, you know, whatever, I met Lou Perlman and I met, you know, but that wasn't really my scene. But just yeah. because it was there, it kind of provided a reason like, oh, there's something going on in Florida. We'll have a guy down there. Right. Yeah. I was happy to be that guy. Yeah. And and then, you know, uh, L.A. too, it was a hotbed there for alternative for a while in the second resurgence, you know, like around 2004, 2005, where you had a lot of these, you know, the true alternative came back like, you know. Red Hot Chili Peppers and Sublime and all that stuff was huge. But then you started having like Arcade Fire and bands like that, you know, Fish started to pop and and, you know, truly stuff that was way off everybody's mainstream radar um, that yeah. that, you know, what was was popping up. And and we happened to be at a really, you know, 
uh, again, right place, right time for that genre of music in Los Angeles. Amazing. So, yeah. I'm I'm actually seeing the chat now. I see Chris Siciliano, my old friend Chris Siciliano. He was a great promo guy, great promotion guy. I always loved when he came around. And uh he may have been one of the ones that was in my ear about doing A and R. Like all the people, only people I knew at labels, like when what we broke some bands and and the, 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 I only knew promotion people. I didn't know there was anybody else at a record label. It never occurred to me. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's so gotta somebody makes the decision on who to sign. Yeah. All right. So tell me your best promo story, like the best promotion job you ever saw a label or a promo guy girl do. Uh, well, C C Siciliano's up there, um, but there, <laughs> it's not even really that great of a story. Yeah, I'm going to shout out a woman named Michelle Block Rhodes that is I'm still friends with. You know, Michelle, right? Oh, very well. Love Michelle. I if like, I don't care I, much for I, her husband Brian, he's kind of a deadbeat. Brian but. sucks, but uh, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> Sorry. I when people say like, well, you know, like not aggressive in a bad way, but just like it, like you would just think in that position of being a music director, a program director, you're just going to pick the best records and the, let the best record win. Well, you only have so many, so much space every week, right? So you're like, I only have room to add two or three records this week, and there's literally twenty promotion people that have bought me dinner and are really <laughs> my phone trying to get me to add their record. And then it get then you start shrinking the list down. Then it that's where it starts to matter is where like, well, I love both of these records. I believe in both of these artists, but Michelle Block Rose just called me for the 19th time. And I think she, it might break her spirit if I don't add this record. You know what I mean? That's where the relationship know, wins relationship right? wins. The relationship wins. Right. Yep. So I don't have some, well, I do. What was that? <laughs> one girl showed up on roller skates one time. I forget even why, like promotion people would tie in the meaning of the record, right? And you would get all this like funky merch. And sometimes they would show up like dressed as yeah, whatever. You know, you would just yeah. have to give it to them. Just like it, it's a, it's like such a funky, weird thing to do. <laughs> sticks in your mind and, and you're just like that matters it matters yeah. it shows that you and your company believes in this record so much that you're in my lobby on fuck, roller skates or whatever yeah. for whatever reason what was yours mine the, I, there was so many that you know good ones but the one that continues to that is in my head is um you remember the band fastball they had a oh. song called the way wow. it was signed to hollywood records scott fink was the promotion guy there and they we we had they were working it up the chart at what didn't really fit what we were doing at Kiss. It was still just a little because it just didn't fit sonically, but it was starting to pop a little bit. And they figured out what time we were going to do our music meeting. We were on the eighth floor of this building in Burbank. They figured out what time the music meeting was going to be. And we were in the conference room and they flew a helicopter outside the building and <laughs> outside the conference room and had um had a guy out there dressed as a baseball player and he was hanging off the side of the helicopter with a big fastball banner saying <laughs> add add the way <laughs> to kiss fm yeah had a, had and, a, you, and it worked you guys nobody got tipped off you guys are just like so anyway totally. this week we're gonna who the yeah and all of a sudden you're like why <laughs> why is there a helicopter like you know 50 feet outside our window oh my and, god and then to see that it was from hollywood records and this guy's holding this banner that says add add a fastball to kiss fm i was like how do we not <laughs> That's how just, do we yeah how do we not save yeah. that guy's life mm -hmm. i i loved and i loved i still have a lot of that merch man i still have Alice in Chains when they came out with Jar of Flies EP, which was one of the greatest yep. moments of the 90s and all those great songs. They literally sent a jar of of <laughs> plastic yeah. flies, not live flies, but with the Alice in Chains, I still have a lot of that stuff. It works, you know? Yeah. I think there's less money. I don't think there's a lot of that going on so much anymore at record yeah. labels. But, so but. Here, here's here's what I, you and I haven't had a chance to catch up on this, but like, the prevailing theory in music, modern music anyway, uh, the last, let's call it five years, is that rock is dead. Like rock's over, man. Rock, Rock's never coming back. The days of Metallica and the, are gone. So you and Mike Easterlin go all in on rock. Like what, what makes you uh, A, confident in that and B, how, how do you make money doing rock in today's world? 
Uh, it's a good question. We're still trying to figure that out, but I know it's <laughs> I know it's happening. So yeah, so the I guess the reason you're asking that question. So left Atlantic Records last year in March, had a year of of uh, severance pay. They paid it. They I, I've never gotten paid for a year for not working, which was literally one of the greatest years of my life. And uh, even though at the end of it, I had to figure something out. So Mike Easterlin, who was running Electra Records and Fueled by Ramen, he's a good friend of mine. We worked on Shinedown together. We worked on Paramore together. He and I both left the company at the same time. He was coming to Nashville. I was already here. We're both friends of the Big Loud Company and Seth England here. And uh, Mike had just talked to Seth when Mike and I were meeting for drinks on our last day of work at the Virgin <laughs> Hotel on Music Row. And uh, where we played uh, Russian roulette with whoever's corporate card was going to run out first. Mine ran out first. It got declined <laughs> on my last day of work. It's just humiliating. It was actually hilarious. But anyway, so <laughs> we met on our last day of work. I just packed up my office, met for drinks. And at the bar at the Virgin, Mike was like, I was just talking to Big Loud about, you know, Seth is like, well, you do marketing and promotion and Steve-O does A&R. Why don't you guys make something? And and so that it was on our last day of work. The idea was born. Um, I love all kinds of music. I love hip hop. I love R&B. Rock is the center of the bullseye for me and uh, and for Mike. And so and but and so it's not like, let's start a company and sign our favorite music. It's you want to do that. But it's also what is the market? What's happening with the market? And I think. You know, country obviously is having a moment unlike any right, other yeah. time in history. It's amazing. And also, I'm not necessarily a pop country guy, but I love Sturgill Simpson and Jason mm -hmm. Isbell and Casey Musgraves. And that is a big slice of the music that I personally love. And it's also happens to be like, and now Zach Bryan and Zach Bryan, Noah, right? Yeah, Noah Kahan, who's not country, but it's acoustic, it's folk, it's guitar oriented. So, anyway, you could feel it coming. There hasn't been bands on the mainstream pop chart in a very long time, possibly mm -hmm. decades. I love bands because, you know, it's it's only those four or five people can make that sound. And it's not doesn't come out of a computer. And I like program beats and everything. I don't mean to sound like an old guy, like it's got to have guitars. Mm -hmm. It I don't care. I just like great music. But I ha do happen to have an affinity for bands. And when, you know, back in the day, if you would go see Oasis or Pearl Jam, uh, it's just, it's transcendent because you're like, wow, nobody else can do this. This is, this is completely unique. It cannot be made any other way than these guys. So having said all that, um, I have a good buddy. He's a great producer and songwriter here in Nashville. His name is Gabe Simon. And Gabe and I were hanging for drinks one time and he had just produced... Noah Kahan and Noah Kahan was doing what Noah Kahan was doing. It was exploding. And we were talking about not only that, but what does it mean? What is and Zach Bryan? And these artists are coming through that are, that are, you know, Zach Bryan records are underproduced. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. And, and it sounds exotic and you're like, what the, this is really different. And it's really just organic. Right. So, Gabe made the point to me. He was like, how do you put it? Oh yeah. He was like, it's like Steve-O, all these kids are buying, like, because Zach Bryan and Noah Kahan are buying acoustic guitars and they're like learning how to play acoustic guitars. He goes, it's only a matter of time before one of them looks at his friend and says, what does this sound like when you plug it in? And he goes, and then you've got Pearl Jam. And I was like, I was like, that's actually makes sense to me. I was like, yeah. Yeah. And then and plus it was just in the air. It wasn't just that one story, but I thought it was a good observation. Like, trends don't just happen all of a sudden they morph yeah. right yeah. so that's why that's why we're like okay we're gonna do this we're gonna sign the music we love we're gonna really lean in on indie rock alternative rock um old country yeah so that's well, I how think we you, you know didn't didn't you find especially because you were still atlantic at the time so for people that don't know when i was at warner corporate uh, steve -O and i were in the same office so we would see each other every single day and i loved that time together and then COVID hits right so we don't we go uh, well over a year without seeing each other yeah um but during that time i just remember all these conversations about how a and r was done via tiktok right yeah. you know as as musically became tiktok everybody at the major labels was just signing TikTok artists. And, you know, 
I always thought, how is that going to be sustainable? How are you going to make a career out of that? Or how are you going to put out a second and third album and successive music off of some kid that's doing this on TikTok? Um, and so, you know, I guess that that kind of seeing you guys do this in a much more, I, probably not traditional way, but you're back to finding artists, right? And we are, yeah, and the people i'm telling you and i'm not just gassing up my partners because they're funding they're funding our operation and we're partners with them so we have a joint venture so yeah. we're, hang on <laughs> we're talking about severance records so this is our logo <laughs> so great at severance records made in house by a great artist that's right down the way that does all the like graphics and stuff for morgan wall and everything and he found out we we're going to do an indie rock label and it's called severance. So he made this dope ass logo for us. That's anyway. So um, and so uh, what was my point? Where was I going with that? Well, we were talking about TikTok. and, and Oh yeah. So and how Seth England and Joey Moy and Greg Thompson and Patch Culbertson and our partners here, like in particular, Joey Moy, Joey Moy, one of the most successful produ producers of all time, produced all the Nickelback records, Florida Georgia Line, Morgan Wallen. Like he's his studio is directly under under me right now. Like everything's in house here. But Joey Moy is one of the partners here at Big Loud, and he doesn't give a fuck about like when I go play him something. Like hey, I really like like he's the, the last thing out of his mouth is like what's the TikTok numbers and what what's their data. Mm -hmm. It's like is there a great singer and is there a possibility they can write great songs and um and th that's it's and it, of course we care about the data after yeah. when we start putting music out data matters yeah. it's not yeah. like oh fuck the data it's it's a real thing to pay attention to but as far as getting in early with an artist and helping them develop don't worry about it we know we have ears we have yeah. gut let's sign it and so um that's it, it, but you know, I'm also not an anti TikTok like Lil Nas X. People forget was like the first TikTok like, and yeah. now he's an iconic pop star. Yeah. So it can happen because you're a TikTok artist doesn't mean you're illegitimate. It just means you're one of many, and which one is actually going to stick around. So, well, um, I've got some uh, I've got some good market research for you. Um, and granted, it's a sample size of two, but you know, I have a 12 year old <laughs> daughter. Right. And um, the other day she was in the living room with her friend and they were doing some dance. And I said, did you find that on TikTok? And she looks at me, rolls her eyes, hands on the hips. And she goes, Daddy, TikTok is for old people. And I was like, really? what? Why? Why do you say that? And she goes, well, you're on TikTok and mommy's on TikTok and you are old. Holy <laughs> shit. And so but then I started thinking about it, like, that's how it happens. Right. Because at some point. Facebook was just kids, yep. right? Was, and and so at some point, you, you know, when when your mom and dad were on Facebook, it wasn't cool anymore. And so then that whole group of people went to Instagram. And at some point, Instagram was for old people. And so, you know, then it was, uh, what was Twitter, uh, not not Twitch, uh, what was the thing that, that Twitter had for a minute? The little short form video, you know, anyway. Uh you mean Vine back in the day? Vine, yeah, Vine, you know? So just, it, it that will happen to TikTok. It will not be cool at some point. But has she moved on to so, something yeah, else? She, she says that she and all her friends watch YouTube shorts. Yeah, I that's, get that. That's what they're on now is, is YouTube shorts. Um, yeah, I mean, we, yes, nothing, nothing lasts. We know that. We know tick, there's something on the other side of TikTok. It is interesting. How, old's Mar how, is, how old is she? 12, 12. She's, She's just 12. started seventh grade. So now to yeah it's funny dude yeah TikTok's my TikTok, old people yeah dude <laughs> i had to make another tiktok account because i'm scrolling all the time all i think we all are if we're in this business you need to know what's going on yeah and um i had we're not supposed i don't want to talk about politics but now it's all politics in my tiktok because they know that i'm like interested that so now i'm like they're feeding me all this i had to make another account and just start liking music stuff again so i could find some you know yeah. stay plugged into the music so right. yeah. it's already feeling like something else needs to happen some other but tiktok you know listen i understand she's 12 and it's like it's for old people and it, it's definitely happening but it's still the biggest radio oh, yeah yeah world has ever sure. known, you know? so uh, there's this guy brad parker hey brad thanks for checking us out he says you guys aren't on boingo yet <laughs> are, are we getting is 
<laughs> are we getting delivered some shit or is that Parker's? Yeah. Hey, Parker's always ahead of the curve. Guys always, <laughs> even if he just makes it up to be yeah. wise. I have, to, I have to go get a Boingo account now. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> That's very funny, man. So, um, so who, who signs the artists over there? Yeah. And, and it sounds like a very similar situation, you know, Jay um, DeMarcus being an artist himself, he built this company specifically for that reason. He said, I don't, I'm, of course the data matters, but similar to your deal, he's like, I want to find artists I believe in and make music that I think matters. And then we'll figure out the rest of the part, you know? Um, and he, so he, you know, we're all about, artist development and he's like listen this isn't an overnight thing you know we're, we're we can afford to be patient we can afford to constantly be making music and evolving the artist and trying to find their audience um so same thing so jay ultimately it's jay's decision who we who we sign right um but you know i the the other cool thing about being super small is that he loves to have everybody with a voice in the room so it doesn't matter if, you know, you're doing digital marketing or if you're, you know, uh, the receptionist at the front desk, you know, everybody's opinion is, is, is valid. And Hey, if you've got an idea or find an artist that you think is, you know, amazing, or there's potential there, we're, we're open to that conversation. We're open to that conversation. You've got to be that way. You, uh, listen, is this too much? <laughs> I love that. Got the logo okay. back. Bad uh, I'm going to go with the hat and the logo for the rest of this conversation. <laughs> I'm excited. It's our new company. We're not even a year old. Severance right. Records. Um, oh, somebody did ask in the chat if if you named the company after your, your year of severance. Oh, yes. Mike <laughs> Easterlin. Mike Easterlin. And, and there's a, probably a lot of people in the chat that have either started a company and you're like, oh, well, now what am I going to name it? And then you just, it is brutal, right? It's like trying to name an artist or whatever. It's like everything sounds bad. And then Mike and I, Mike's a golfer and I'm a surfer and I play disc golf and he plays real golf. Like it's, it's, we have this in common, but we don't have a lot in common outside. And so a golfer and a surfer, we're like, oh, green wave records. And we're like, that sucks. <laughs> and then Mike, I have to give him credit. Mike texted me one day. It was just like, cause we're on a year of severance pay. And he was like severance records. I was like, oh shit, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and then the big Seth and everybody at Big Loud and Big Loud Rock really liked it. And um, so, yeah. So, and it was, you know, we, we spent weeks and weeks with long lists and chat. Yeah, I bet. Terrible lists generated by chat GPT. We're like, maybe <laughs> AI knows what the name of our company is. It didn't. It didn't work. But anyway, so yes, it is because we were on a year of severance pay and, and no disrespect to where I, I love Atlantic Records and I love the people that I used to work with. So it wasn't really like an F you to them. It was more, this is where we're at. You yeah. know what I mean? We're, we're, we're two guys that are, that are not young guys that have been in the business. We still have a lot to offer and we're in this free floating year of still getting paid severance pay. And I don't know, it just felt right. So, um, so yeah, now we got three artists signed. We signed this band Dexter and the Moon Rocks. Uh, they have a song called Sad in Carolina that, I mean, we didn't start this as a radio, like let's go to radio, like radio right. still matters, but radio is now not the first thing a lot of times. Yeah, it's, in, it's usually last. It's right. It's usually last because so, until you have a streaming story, it's a, it, it's impossible to go, you know, cut through the noise. Uh, I think Mike and I, Mike's a radio guy. I'm a radio guy. You're a radio guy. I think we were overcompensating for not wanting to be like a radio promotion company, even though we're yeah. a record label. And then the band just happened to write an amazing EP. And we had heard this song called Sad in Carolina. And then we just kind of bounced it off some gatekeeper people like um, Alt Nation, Regan and Alt Nation. He's like, this song's amazing. And then he starts playing and we're like, you know what? I guess we're going to radio. And luckily the band was selling they can sell over a thousand tickets in a bunch of markets. And so there was a real band developing. And so now we have a song called Sad in Carolina um, in the mid twenties now at the alternative chart and it's doing great. And, and that's Dexter and the moon rocks. And that's, you know, it's a proud moment for us. It's our first signing and yeah. you know, we have a long way to go. Don't get me wrong. Um, and we have, and just to give you a little quick back, there's only three of us at severance records. We're inside big loud rock and big loud. 
And that's how we part. That's how we do it. But we're like a little surgical team and we develop, develop, develop. And we have a guy, our first and only hire is Trevor Provost, who is not a radio promotion guy. He's a digital ninja, knows influencer marketing, knows how to. So he's like a product manager, digital marketer, all these things rolled into one. And so he takes the artist that we sign and he sets, he sets the release schedule. He sets the promotion of, uh, of uh, social media and the guy is brilliant. And so, and you're right. Yeah. Radios. We want to do all that before we yeah. start talking about radio. And so in the case of Dexter, it came sooner, but also it's, it's working out because I think we did it in the right order. Nice. Um, yeah. So uh, oh, and then just real quick, Dexter and the moon rocks, our second signing, I don't know if I can say this out loud yet. <laughs> Actually, never mind. We signed two other bands we're very excited about, and we're about to announce one. Uh, now you're going to break uh, some news here on on the smartest people in the room today, Steve. I but feel no. like we have a plan, and it's to roll it out in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> anyway, sorry. Sorry I even started that. I love it. Um, my friend Rio from The Orchard is on the chat. So, hey, Rio, thanks for checking us out. Appreciate it um <laughs> strom john strom i love that he's on here he's like this is a safe space no it's not it's the internet john <laughs> oh that's that's priceless um yeah if anybody's got questions i'll try and keep up with the chat here if uh, if anybody wants to ask any questions but um so what's what's the rest of the year look like for you from you know um like a personal standpoint like are you traveling at all are you not like i was but I do, um, I do now I'm looking at the chat. Now I'm distracted. I was trying not to look at it because I kept seeing stuff like pop up. I don't even know half the stuff is going on here. And now I'm yeah. like, I was Maybe purposely yeah. not looking at it. So no, I was always on the road as an A&R guy at Atlantic records. I'm, uh, I'm a little choosier about travel. We're a smaller operation. I'm trying to keep budgets in line. So, you know, if I take a trip, um, I've got to be able to accomplish a few things, uh, at the same time. So, um, so I'm keeping it pretty local out a lot here in Nashville, Nashville, uh, we know, I mean, we love this place. And if the people in the chat have not been to Nashville, uh, it's stay not, home, stay home. <laughs> stay, actually, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I should just leave it like, yeah, you're right. It's not that great. No, an incredible city. And, um, I, it's amazing the amount of music that you can see in one week. Right. I mean, yeah. Any major market, you're going to get good tours coming through. But here, there's this extra level of support of the greatest musicians in the world live here. And this, they just go out and jam some nights. And if yeah. you're in the right place at the right time, you can really catch some special music. So, yeah. um, Lisette is in the chat. She said, you guys talked about artist development earlier. What does it mean to you both in today's landscape? Go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I think what I touched on earlier, the the fact of being patient, that you know, developing an artist doesn't happen overnight. Um, we don't have a staff of 30 people that are crafting some magical plan in the back room of, you know, what this artist is and needs to be. So I think just for us at Red Street, the type of artists we sign um, are going to need development. And, um, you know, some of them will be more proficient in social media than others. Some of them will be more accomplished musicians than others. Some of them are better songwriters than others. And so developing the, you know, taking the great songwriter and helping them become an artist is one, you know, side of the development. You know, taking the great artist who's super comfortable on the stage and puts on an incredible show with, you know, world-class musicians maybe need some handholding in what they're going to create for social media content. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that, again, that is not a, Hey, we sat down for three hours and captured some content and we're going to cut it up and, and send it out on Instagram. That's, that's like, who, what's your voice? How do you, how do you want to interact with your audience on social media versus when you stand on a stage? Because those are different interactions. So I think that's, in my head, that's what developing an artist is in today's world. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add to that, except for more a and focused, you know, the songs are everything. And a sound is great. A vibe is great. But, you know, the one thing that we are sticklers about is it's got to be the best possible songs you could, you could write. Because uh, it's like 
it, how do you break through? How do you punch through now? How did mm -hmm. the, everybody's looking in a, and listening in a different direction? How do you connect the billions of dots that looks like the matrix, right? It's like how everybody's staring at the, all these zeros and ones. And then how do you make an impact? And it's songs, you know what I mean? It's yeah. incredible songs. That's the, and it's subjective. What is like, what makes one song better than the other? I don't know. I've got my point of view and we've got a label and we try to help our artists get there. Um, and so that's another big part of it. And whether they just need feedback from an A&R person or whether they need uh, to meet, you know, songwriters and producers that kind of help them stumble into some areas they might not have gotten to. Yeah. Um, we do all that. And it's, it's, there's never, it's not one way to do it. It's not a cookie. It's rock music too. I don't want it to be cookie cutter. I don't want it to be snapped to a grid. It's got to sound like this. And the, you got to get to the hook at this point. Like it's a little bit of a looser vibe. So anyway, that's a big part of the artist development here. And uh, Mark, I think his last name, is it Frigo? Frigo? Frigo. Uh, yeah. It. A asking about um, what what's the upside for an artist signing to a label in today's world? Because you can you know, if you're savvy enough, you can DIY it almost all the way, you know? It's, um, that's an incredibly good question. And we talk about it all the time. And I was talking to uh, an A&R guy, a friend of mine who has signed some gigantic bands. I, we just had coffee yesterday to talk about the same thing because there are some meetings I'll get into with artists that I love and they're like, well, that are killing it on their own. And mm -hmm. You know, yes, I'm in the record business and yes, I want to sign artists and yes, I want to build a successful business by helping them make hit record, all that stuff. Um, there's a bunch of different situations. Sometimes artists are great and they're trying, they, you know, they don't have a van. They don't have a, you know, there's all these things they need. That's where the label being the bank, yeah, that's a real thing. It's not the only thing we do. We are creative people and we it's certainly not just, you know, pushing papers, but we offer budgets. It's like, oh, if we sign here, we that'll give us money. And then plus we need tour support. We don't really have an audience yet. So we provide tour support and expertise in record making and our, my network of producers and mixers and writers. And there's a whole suite of things that come into it. But I am the first to admit that not every artist needs it now. There's a whole yeah. world that, but if you're going to reach a certain level, if you're going to be national and then international, um, I do believe you need that kind of team behind you. Yeah. You know, the, the thing that I, especially after my time, my five years at Warner that I saw was <clears throat> if, if you don't need any of those things, the, the bank, what, what record companies are really good at is pulling all the levers at the same time. Right. Yeah. You know, making sure that the marketing message is lined up with the PR message and and having all those things happen at the same time um, for maximum exposure. I think that's what record companies are still very good at. 100%. Uh, that um, that uh, may be um, uh, some muscle that an artist needs outside of a bank, you know, the, the bank aspect. So, um, And there's more levers now than there ever were, whether it's the TikTok lever or the Instagram lever or the Boingo lever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Ugh. So Rio from The Orchard just asked about how, um, you know, Round Hill moved their operation here to Nashville. Pure Noise is here. Um, I think um, Sumerian Records has moved to Nashville. As I heard well. that, yeah. Um, so she's saying what, what, what specifically in the rock genre seems to be why, why Nashville, um, a town known for country music and are there rock bands that are breaking out of Nashville specifically? Um, our third signing, I should have thought of this before we get on here, whether I should just willy nilly talk about the artists that we have not announced yet. We haven't announced these artists, but our third signing was, is a band from, um nashville oh and fuck it they're called edge hill okay so <laughs> uh and they I, they you know they're a ba talk about a baby band they are a baby band like they're but we just fell in love with them so i this is not a rah-rah thing i'm not doing this for anybody like i love nashville so much and if you're gonna do the infrastructure here it does it's not just made for country music it's made for music yeah the hundreds of studios and the venues. And so 
uh, more power to country music. It built a big part of this town, but it, you know, guitar based music, rock, it just fits right in, you mm-hmm. know? And the building I'm in right now, Big Loud, and they have a, a new label called Big Loud Rock. Yeah. And Hardy, like, is a rock artist. Like, Hardy mm-hmm. is a country artist, now is as legit in the rock world as as anybody. Yeah. And so the walls, the genre walls have fallen. We've totally. known for a while, right? Yep. And now um, we have to call certain things, certain things just to do business. Say, oh, that's a rock thing. And that's not. But you can't be you can't be rain you can't be limited by oh that's only a rock thing yeah because the shit goes everywhere yeah. and there's there's hybrid playlists that you know really join the world of country and rock now like all over the place yeah and and that's and- haven't you found that that's how kids listen too right they my daughter doesn't even know she wouldn't even know how to label a song rock or pop or hip-hop yep. it's just songs and, and she likes them. She likes country stuff. She likes some jelly roll. She mm. likes Noah Kahan, but she likes, you know, Gracie Abrams and she likes, you know, uh, Doja Cat. So they're just songs. Yeah. And at, at most it's a mood, right? Yeah. She would say, oh, I'm getting ready to go out with my friends. I'll put Doja Cat on. Or I want to cry in my room for a while. I put Noah Kahan on. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, those are the genres. It's like a mood. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tom, how are we doing on time? You want us to keep going? Or are we, because <laughs> I, I don't know if, uh, I know you said uh, an hour, so we're at about uh, 56 minutes, but. I know I'm enjoying the heck out of this, and I know several <laughs> others are. Um, I Good. appreciate, hey, Steve, I appreciate the world premiere of Edge Hill taking place yeah. today. That's awesome. Thank uh, you. Jordan Berger and I both want one of those hats. I don't know where we get those, but uh, Are you guys selling merch over there at Severance? Yeah, they're only yeah, is it twenty-seven dollars. Well, in all seriousness, it is time to wrap it up, and I just want to high five you through the Zoom here. I knew you guys were going to kill this. It's been awesome. Um, love what you're doing. Big fan of both of you personally and professionally, and I know a lot of the folks in this chat are as well. To the audience, I promised you, you would leave here and more enlightened and smarter than you arrived. And I think we delivered on that today. And so good on you for coming. Um, We are going to be dark for the next couple of weeks as we celebrate Labor Day, but we'll be back here in early September. And I want to wish everybody a nice, safe, long holiday weekend. Be nice to each other. And um, that's all I have to say. And Tom, I want to thank you for doing this because... um... You know, when I'd been to a couple of your who knew's at the city winery when I first moved to town, they're incredibly valuable. And then, you know, when you started doing this, when COVID hit, um, it really was a bright spot in the work day. You know, everybody's at home sitting in front of their computer. I've got a little girl trying to go to second grade, you know, via Zoom. And knowing that every other Thursday at one o'clock, I could at least take a break and, you know, learn something, but also see some people um, was was very gratifying. So thanks for keeping it going, even after COVID is over. Um, Really enjoyed doing it with you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Really appreciate those kind words. I, I This is my passion project. I love shining a light on cool people like yourself who are getting really interesting things done in this crazy market. So good luck to both of you in your new ventures. To the audience, we'll see you soon. Take care, thanks, folks. Guys. All right, guys. Good luck.